Hi, I'm Jonathan Edwards, and I want to welcome you to the Jed Breaks Bread podcast. My goal in this podcast is to teach the truth of the Word of God and apply it to our lives that our orthopraxy might be as good as our orthodoxy. May you be blessed. Well, today was the day that my two oldest children went back to school. Summer for them is officially over. They are back in school. I'm not sure that they're thrilled about it. I think my oldest is. She loves school. The second oldest, the six-year-old, eh, not so much. She's never really been into school. Nevertheless, she has to endure school, and it's good to be back in a schedule and back to a routine. I know that my wife and I were looking forward to the kids going back to school just in the sense that it will restore some type of routine to our lives. Summer break is kind of crazy, hectic, and when you're having fun and doing a lot of activities, the normal schedules that you cultivate during a school year can get thrown off. And not just the eating, sleeping, what are we doing today kind of schedule, but you know your spiritual schedule can get thrown off as well. One of the lessons that I've taught for many years to both teenagers and students returning to college is entitled Three Keys to a Spiritually Successful Year. Three keys to a spiritually successful year. And, you know, I'm finding that as I grow up in my adulthood, as I continue on into the mid-30s, I would imagine as I get older, Lord willing, that these realities will be important to evaluate and to take time to reset periodically throughout the year. And so that's what I would encourage you today. If if you have a child that's going back to school, maybe you should take this podcast, this episode, and share these three keys with them. But you should also take this podcast and share these three keys with your spouse and say, you know what? Maybe these are three things that we ought to focus on as our kids go back to school. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're homeschool, whether you're public school, whether you go to Christian school. School, no matter what it is, brings about a routine. And it's good for us. It's profitable for us to evaluate our routine, to think about what we're doing and why we're doing it, to take time to reset and recultivate good and godly habits. So this lesson that I developed, um, I'm looking at it right now. The Word document says for January 2009, but I think I wrote this lesson in 2008 and delivered it to a group of students at uh, Campus Crusade at Heidelberg College, back when it was still Heidelberg College and not Heidelberg University in Tiffin, Ohio. So what I have here is three keys to a spiritually successful year. And this lesson begins by defining success. What is success? You know, the world defines success as being better than other people having more than other people, being really well-known or famous in whatever it is that you decide to do. The unbelieving world defines success primarily by how good you are in comparison to other people who do the same thing that you do. Do you have more money than them? Do you have more degrees than them? Do you have a higher prestige or ranking or more seniority than them? You are a more successful person. Is your wife more beautiful? Is your husband have better hours or more handsome? Do you drive nicer cars? You get the idea. That's not how we're defining success. We're defining success from a biblical perspective. Spiritual success, true biblical success, is comparing yourself to the Word of God and seeing whether you measure up to the lofty standards that are found within. Spiritual success is comparing yourself to yourself and saying, have I grown in the last year? Have I grown in the last six months? Am I willing to put in the time necessary in the word, in prayer, in meditation? Am I willing to put in the time necessary so that I can become transformed into the image of Christ? That's spiritual success. 
being transformed into the image of Christ. Now, there are three keys to having spiritual success. And the first is to spend time reading God's Word every single day. Now, I don't think it really matters whether you read three chapters, three verses, 30 verses. I think it's important that you read God's Word every single day and that you meditate and think about the truths that you find therein. In fact, Psalm chapter 1, the first chapter in the longest book of the Bible, sets the tone for the entire book of Psalms by contrasting the righteous person and the wicked person and their attitude towards the Word of God. Listen to what the psalmist says. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. What? His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree, firmly planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. That's the man who meditates in the law of the Lord. And obviously the psalmist, when he talks about the law of the Lord, is talking about the scriptures, the Old Testament writings, the writings of Moses, the writings of wisdom, the writings of the prophets. And we know from our perspective on this side of the cross that the entire 66 books of the canon of the Bible, those comprise the law of the Lord. Verse 1 says, blessed is the man. You could literally translate that Hebrew word blessed as happy. Happy is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Have you ever noticed that when you spend time, let's say you go to a conference or a retreat, or you spend time on vacation, and you're able to have more time in the Word or more time being influenced by Christian people, or you're hearing some good messages, that your spirit is generally uplifted. You generally have a more positive outlook on life. That's because you're not being swayed. You're not being brought down. You're not being beaten over the head with the ideas of the wicked, the ways of sinners, or listening to the rabble-rousing of scoffers. Happy is the man who spends time in God's Word. So I would say this, the first key to a spiritually successful school year, a back-to-school reset, is to spend time in the Word of God. Do it every single day. I love how the psalmist compares the man who spends time in the Word to a tree that is firmly planted by streams of water. I once had the opportunity to witness um, some straight-line winds that went past my house and a tornado touched down maybe a few miles from where I live. This was a number of years ago. And I was in my basement looking out the window, and these massive maple trees were bent nearly in half outside in the yard. But when the wind stopped, they straightened right back up and resumed their shape. Now those trees were firmly planted. Those trees were not going to be toppled over by a strong wind. And that's how the Christian should be. The Christian should be so firmly planted, so rooted in the Word of God that the lies and the misinformation and the deceit that is brought about by Satan and his demonic horde and unbelievers does not shake your faith. You are rock solid because you have your feet firmly planted in the Word of God. So now that everybody's getting back to a routine, get back to a routine of reading the Word of God every single day. The next thing that I would encourage believers to do 
is to really take a good look at the sin that is in your life. It's easy to become complacent. It's easy to allow the idols of heart to grow. It's easy to let weeds grow up in your garden. Sometimes you miss them. Sometimes you're busy. You don't want to pull the weeds. But I think if you're going to be spiritually successful in being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, that's the goal for every believer. We've got to work hard to eliminate sin from your life. There is an attitude in Christianity today that really is distressing. And that is that God's love will just overcome any sin that we commit. That it's not really worth struggling or striving against sin. That we don't really need to worry about it too much because God's love and God's grace covers us. You know, this is a very old fallacy, one that was common in the ancient world, common in the New Testament era. Wait a minute, the New Testament era? Sure. Paul dealt with this particular fallacy that God's love and God's grace was so great that he would just overlook the sins that we committed. We didn't really have to worry about them. Paul dealt with this in Romans chapter 5. He says this, Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Now, where the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So what is he saying? When God gave the law to Moses and the Israelites, the amount of trespasses increased because their knowledge increased. If you have the word of God today, your knowledge is greatly increased over what is sin versus the person who doesn't have the word of God or doesn't use the word of God. You know a lot about what is sin and what is not sin. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. You know, you have the word of God. You see the depths of the depravity, the extent of sin. We can recognize it in our personal lives. But what does the text say? Grace abounded all the more. That is the incredible blessing that we partake in as believers, that though our sins are so many, God's grace and God's mercy is greater than all of our sins, and he is able to justify us in his courtroom. He is able to wipe our transgressions off the slate. He wipes our record clean. We no longer bear them. Grace is greater than our sins. Verse 21 of Romans 5, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. That's a great truth. You know what? Sin reigns in death, but grace reigns through righteousness, which leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ. But you know what some of the believers were doing in the first century? They were saying this, well, If God's grace is infinite and he can forgive all of our sins, why don't we just go ahead and sin? That'll bring more glory to God because if we sin more and God gets the glory for forgiving us of these sins, then it'll bring God more glory when we sin more. And that's not the right attitude. And Paul rebukes them. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Are we to sin more so that God's grace can be demonstrated to a greater degree? I think some Christians in our culture today have that idea that, hey, it's okay if we sin a lot. It's okay if the transgression has increased because God's grace will be uplifted. God's grace will be magnified. God will get the glory. It'll be just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Paul says that is absolutely the wrong and incorrect way to think about God's grace and our personal sin. Verse 2, by no means. This is the English Standard Version. The New American Standard says, may it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
Paul says, this is an impossibility. What you're requesting, what you're thinking is absolutely the wrong way to evaluate the present circumstances. If you died to sin, if God set you free from the curse of sin, if God set you free from the penalty of sin, from slavery to sin, why would you want to continue to live in it? Why would you want to go back and do that again? If sin is like filthy rags, like the rags that you use to wipe up vomit, why would you want to go back and pick those rags up and carry them around? You don't want to do that. You want to get rid of them. You want them far removed from you. And that should be our attitude towards sin. Christian, you must eliminate sin from your life. Look what Paul says a few verses later in Romans 6. So then, you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Paul's concluding his argument here in Romans chapter 6 by saying, look, prior to the cross, prior to your conversion to Christ, you had no choice but to sin. You were enslaved to it. But now that you have been saved, now that you are a new creature in Christ, You have died to the old man. The old man is gone. You don't have to be enslaved to sin anymore. And therefore, sin has no dominion over you. Don't live under sin. Don't continue to practice it. And we let it go. We let sin go. We let little weeds of sin crop up in our garden. And we don't worry about them because, well, they're just a little weed. Don't worry about that. It's just a little weed. You know, I have a big, beautiful yard. Look at this wonderful yard that I have. There's a couple spots here and there of weeds. Or look at this big, beautiful garden. Lots of vegetables, uh, kale, good things to eat. Ah, There's a few weeds here and there. I don't worry about those. I just look at the good stuff. No. No, if we're going to be really spiritually successful, if we're going to be really transformed in the image of Christ, we've got to get rid of those little weeds. Get rid of those small patches of weeds. And we need to use the Word of God to do it. We need to use the Word of God to do it. It is the Word of God that is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and able to pierce the division of bone and marrow, of soul and spirit. Those are very tight places, by the way. Very difficult to do. But the Word of God is capable of piercing even the most minute detail, of revealing even the smallest weed or patch of weeds. We need to eliminate sin from our life. That requires a great deal of prayer and discipline and making new habits. That's one of the things that I think I'm probably asked the most as a pastor. How do I break a sinful habit? Well, it just it takes time. It takes time, prayer, consistency, reading the Word, and memorizing Scripture. It takes a lot of practice, but you can do it. You can overcome sin. That doesn't mean you'll become totally perfect. We don't believe in perfectionism. We don't teach perfectionism. We don't teach total sanctification uh, in this life. But what what it does mean is that there will be a a sharp incline of progress. And what I mean by that is there will be steady and measurable growth in how you have reduced sin in your life. You will be able to look back a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, and say, man, I, I used to be really bad at this, but now I'm a lot better. And you're not saying that in a prideful or boastful way. You're just saying that in a way that is realistic, true, a way that 
has a godly evaluation to your life. That's something that we all must strive for as believers. We don't have the choice to become a believer and then live any way we want to. We must, we must work to eliminate sin from our lives. Finally, the third piece of advice, the third key, if you will, the third habit to get into is to find an accountability partner. Find somebody who you trust who will help you accomplish number one and number two. Some people have a hard time being disciplined to accomplish things on their own. But if you have another person that you're striving together with, boy, two can really accomplish a lot, far more than one. There is extra motivation. There is extra accountability. There is a determination not to let somebody else down. You know, obviously we don't want to let Jesus down, but, you know, he's not here in the room with me. Well, he is, but physically he's not here in the room with me. I don't answer to him. I don't look him in the eyes, but if I have an accountability partner that I have to look in the eyes and he says, when's the last time you looked at pornography? When's the last time you lied? When's the last time you And you fill in the blank. And you share those things with one another. You have to keep confidence. Don't betray the confidence of a brother. But when you have to answer those questions face to face with another brother or sister in Christ, boy, it helps you to really grow. When's the last time you yelled at your kids in unrighteous, unholy anger? How do you define yelling? That's a good question. Are you treating your wife with respect and living with her in an understanding way? Now, these are all the questions that you ask one another as you are accountable to one another and really to the Word of God. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. They're talking, of course, about the iron of a sharpening rod and the iron of a knife. Iron sharpens iron. You know, the sharpening rod and the knife both lose little tiny pieces of metal when you run one across the other. They both have some rough edges knocked off. But in the end, the knife gets real sharp and real effective. And it becomes a useful tool And that's what you're doing when you find an accountability partner, when you find somebody who you can trust to share life with, who you can ask these types of questions to. You can really sharpen one another so that you are more effective tools in God's toolbox. Now, if you're married, this is easy to find an accountability partner. If your spouse is a believer, it should be your spouse. That should be one of your accountability partners is your spouse. And I tell you what, there is nothing more humbling than having your spouse tell you some things that you're doing wrong. And I appreciate my wife. She tells me these things that I do wrong that maybe other people don't know or maybe don't have the courage to say. But I thank God that I have a wife who's willing to speak truth into my life so that I can be a better father, a more godly father, a more godly husband, and a more godly under-shepherd to the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. If you have a spouse and you're already accountability partners, I would encourage you to find also another accountability partner. If you're a man, find a man. If you're a lady, find a lady. Find someone of the same gender. You know, there's only two of those, okay? So either a boys with boys and girls with girls, okay? Same gender. Find someone you can trust someone who's not going to take your secrets and share them with other people. Find someone who's interested in growing in Christ, not just hanging out. Now, that doesn't mean every time you get together, it has to be a serious, deep theological discussion. But you've got to find somebody who's really interested in growing in Christ. Otherwise, that won't happen when you get together. Spending time hanging out is good. Not terrible. It's good. 
But you also need to have some time where you challenge each other according to the Word of God. Have some time where you pray. Have some time where you talk about spiritual growth. Now, these three things that I've presented here, these back-to-school habits, keys to a spiritually successful semester, however you want to call it. Look, this really isn't a formula like you think of 1 plus 1 equals 2 or you know, x plus 8 equals 14, solve for x. It's not a formula. What I'm presenting is how Christians ought to treat God's Word, how Christians ought to treat sin, and how Christians ought to encourage one another. You can't just start doing this formula mindlessly. It has to be purposeful. It has to be intentional. You have to allow the Word of God to sink into your heart, to enrich your thinking, to transform your mind so that you know what the will of God is because it's the Word of God. Yeah, you can package it up as three easy points, but it's not an easy formula to practice. Cultivating these habits are challenging. We need a reset. Everyone needs a time for a reset. And so I would encourage you today, it's back to school time. Think about these three things. Getting in the Word every day. Eliminating sin from your life. Finding an accountability partner. Think about those three things and start putting them into practice today. Start cultivating that habit in your life today. And maybe six months from now, go back and re-listen to this episode so that you can reset yourself again. And life, Satan, demons, it all is working against your spiritual growth. Now, God is for your spiritual growth, and God can empower you, and God will enable you, and I guarantee you that your pastor wants you to grow, your family wants you to grow, but there are spiritual forces of darkness out there that don't want you to grow. And so, yeah, this is hard work. It takes time. It takes intentional thought. It takes saying no to the good and saying yes to what is better. If you follow these things, if you really put them into practice, you will grow in Christ. You will have a greater peace. You will see transformation in relationships. Doesn't mean everything's going to be easy peasy. But what it does mean is that when the difficult times and the sufferings come, when that wind wants to blow your tree over, it won't be able to do so because you'll be firmly planted deep in the Word of God. To Christ be all the glory. Amen. Well, if you live in Northwest Ohio, I would encourage you to come visit our church. We're the Grace Brethren Chapel, located on the corner of State Route 590 and State Route 20. Check us out on the web at www.gbchapel.org. Thanks again to Stephen Lore and the Eslor Music Group for their behind-the-scenes production work on the Jed Breaks Bread podcast and their promotion of this podcast in the Word of God. Check them out on Facebook at Eslor Music Group or email at eslor.musicgroup at gmail.com. God bless.